Welcome to the Panorama Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm Matt Lupu. If you're enjoying the Panorama Podcast, you can subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app. If you do, please consider reviewing the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Positive reviews really do help. You can also support us directly at patreon.com slash panorao, or check out our website, panorao.com. There you will find direct links to the podcast, articles, and news about upcoming Panorao projects. I'm also happy to announce the launch of our YouTube channel. Check out our very first video about the Western Wall. And now, on to the show. Today's episode is a special one for me. That's because... I finally got to answer a few questions for myself in the research for this episode that have been bothering me for at least 15 years. I don't think I've ever specifically gotten into how I chose classics and why I would make the decision to put my whole life on hold and run away to join the circus. But largely, it's because of my family story. My father moved from Romania to Canada when he was 18 years old. He later on met my mother. The two of them got married and gave birth to me in South Florida. It wasn't long before I realized that something was different about my family than those of my friends. My father had a weird accent and spoke a foreign language. It wasn't just him, though. It was everybody on that side of the family. The thing is, is that the language that he did speak was not a common one. This was a language that I had zero experience with outside of my immediate family members. That is to say, my grandmother and her extended family, my father, my uncle, and a few distant cousins. From my perspective as a child in South Florida, these were the only people on earth to speak this language. The language that they spoke was Romanian, and I had been told numerous times by everybody in the family that this language was a romance language. The way that they described it to me was that Romanian was similar to Italian, which in turn was similar to Spanish. Now, Spanish was a language that I was much more familiar with, All of my friends from my days in elementary and middle school had relatives that were foreigners, but their foreign relatives were all Hispanic, either from Cuba or from some other part of South America or the Caribbean. Either way, Spanish being the common language that it is in South Florida gave all of my friends a sense of identity and community that I totally lacked. It wasn't the fact that my family was foreign, It was the fact that they were obscurely so. There were no other Romanian kids to hang out with. There was no greater Romanian community. I never had the experience of going to the Romanian part of town and then having to use my father's language to communicate with the barber or at the Romanian restaurant. These experiences were much more common for my Spanish-speaking and bilingual friends. The older I got, the more curious the situation looked to me. As I learned about the Roman Empire in high school, the idea that French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian were all somehow related felt right to me. If you look at a map of Western Europe, you can see all of those countries are sort of clustered together in one way or another. France and Spain and Italy are certainly a vast swath of territory, and they're definitely separated by quite a bit of land. But you could see how one could walk a straight line from northern Italy into Portugal. Therefore, it made sense in a certain way that all of the languages should be related. But what about Romania? If you look at that country on a map, you'll see it's kind of like an island surrounded by Slavic-speaking 
neighbors. For example, Romania to the south is bordered by Bulgaria. Bulgarian is a Slavic language, much like Russian or Ukrainian is. To the west, Romania is bordered by Hungary. Hungarian is not a Slavic language, but instead has its own bizarre history and origins that are totally unrelated to the Roman Empire. So how is it possible that this country, very far away from the Italian peninsula, and only occupied by the Roman Empire for a very brief period of time, still exists an Eastern Romance language all by itself in a neighborhood surrounded by Slavs and Magyars. I asked this question to a friend of mine when I was in dental school. How is it possible that Romania, a country so isolated and by itself, still retains its Romance language status? My friend said to me, you should really read this book. It's called The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. And indeed, I did read the book, and the more I read, the more I wanted to know. In a lot of ways, this question is directly responsible for my turn to the classics. Unfortunately for me, my long diversion into the study of ancient civilization and the history of the Roman Empire had been largely silent on educating me to the origin story of Romania. That's because the classics, at least as it's taught in the U.S., tends to hyper-focus on certain periods where the most extant literature comes from. These are the periods of the late Republic and early Empire. For an understanding of how Romania came to be a Romance-language-speaking country in the middle of Eastern Europe, I would have to apply all of the skills and techniques that I learned during my graduate work in the classics but I would have to apply them independently. And that is what I intend to do today. This episode will serve to hopefully answer the question, where did Romania come from and who are the Romanians? Before I begin, a couple of words by way of introduction are necessary. The story of Romania in many ways begins with the Emperor Trajan. Trajan was a particularly aggressive conquering emperor. He marched almost all the way to India, certainly to the mouth of the Persian Gulf. But he also famously campaigned in a territory known as Dacia. This territory was located near the delta of the Danube River as the river empties out into the Black Sea. Dacia is the territory immediately north of the Danube. It was home to a native tribe of people known as the Dacians. These people were goldsmiths and gold miners par excellence. One of the reasons why Trajan came to this territory was economic. Trajan was particularly interested in new supplies of gold for the Roman Empire. It just so happened that Trajan inherited his empire at a time when the traditional gold reserves and supply of gold for the empire, mines located in central Spain, were beginning to go dry. As a result, Trajan found himself needing to bankroll an ever more complicated military and political apparatus while simultaneously realizing that his ability to do so was quite hampered. For these reasons, Trajan launched his campaign against the Dacian people. When all was said and done, a new province was minted. This was the province of Dacia. One of the prime reasons why Trajan's campaign is interesting to classicists is because he immortalized it in a monument known as Trajan's Column. You can still visit this column in Rome. It's composed of several panels that are carved in relief, spiraling all the way up this column, which stood as a centerpiece for a kind of library. The idea would have been that in antiquity, you could 
climb up a set of staircases, check out books on each shelf, and walk up to a landing where you could look up close at yet another section of the column. Trajan's column is important to us because it shows us what legionary soldiers would have looked like at the height of Rome's military prowess. In fact, you can see the soldiers on Trajan's column executing certain military exercises, perhaps the most famous of which is the testudo, or the tortoise formation. This formation resembled a kind of primitive tank. You can imagine that the soldiers on the outsides of the formation would have their shields interlocked, whereas people in the middle would lift their shields up over their heads, forming a kind of a roof. This way, all the soldiers could walk in step with each other and withstand barrages from enemy missiles or rocks or spears. These types of formations and descriptions of the arms and armor exist in the literature, but absent monuments like Trajan's Column, I don't think we would have the same kind of appreciation for what exactly the Roman military looked like at its prime. The sources that we have that describe the conquest of Dacia are relatively good. In particular, we have Cassius Dio, who's a historian of late antiquity, Lactantius, Pliny the Younger, the Historia Augusta, Eutropius, Aurelius Victor, and so on. The problem comes when we want to talk about what happened. What happened to the Roman province? The sources in this second case are much more poor. In fact, I can read to you very comfortably just about all of the ancient evidence that we have for the end of the Roman presence in Dacia. This comes from a later historian of the Roman Empire who is writing about the Emperor Aurelian. He says, The province of Dacia, which Trajan had formed beyond the Danube, he gave up, despairing, after all Illyricum and Moesia had been depopulated, of being able to retain it. The Roman citizens, removed from the town and lands of Dacia, he settled in the interior of Moesia, calling that Dacia, which now divides the two Moesiae, and which is on the right hand of the Danube, as it runs to the sea, whereas Dacia was previously on the left. He was killed through the treachery of one of his own slaves, who carried to certain military men, the friends of Aurelian, their own names entered upon a list, having counterfeited the hand of Aurelian, and making it appear that he intended to put them to death. And that is all we know about the end of the Roman occupation of Dacia. Perhaps now is a good time to take a breath. Trajan would have conquered Dacia by 117 AD. If we're to believe Eutropius and understand that all Roman interests were evacuated from the territory by 270 AD, that means that the territory of Dacia was occupied for roughly 150 years. Compare that with the Roman occupation of Spain, or Gaul, or even England. The Roman occupations of Spain and Gaul were both more on the order of 500 years. And indeed, there is a school of thought that says no Romance languages exist without an occupation for at least that long. This seems to confuse the situation in the case of Romanian rather than to help clarify it. If Romania was only occupied for 150 years, then by all rights, it should not be a Romance language at all. But it turns out the Romans did not completely abandon their interest in the territory with their evacuation in 270. Instead, they maintained forts on the north bank of the Danube, and we have coins from the area which date to well after the evacuation. For example, coins have been found in archaeological contexts 
that can be identified as belonging to the Emperor Gratian. These would date to around 375 to maybe 383 AD. It's this next part of Romanian history that is controversial. Our sources no longer mention Latin speakers in the area, except for very incidentally, and only once in a while. The next mention of a distinctly Romanian people in the written record comes from a book called The Gesta Hungarorum, or The Deeds of the Hungarians, written at some point between 1150 and 1200 AD. This source refers to the Vlachs as being the shepherds of the Romans, and that they came into the area sometime in the 9th century. So what happened? Well, there are two theories. Each of these theories is colored by current politics and the politics of the greater 20th and 19th centuries in which they were developed. The first theory is known as the continuation theory. It was particularly popular with groups like the ethnically Romanian people of Transylvania in their search for independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This theory argues that when subsequent barbarian kingdoms would control the former imperial territory of Dacia, they would rule over a vast number of Romanized peasants who never went anywhere. It holds that the evacuation of Dacia by Aurelian was limited to imperial functionaries and other bureaucrats, but not the whole population. The peasants would live continuously under the subsequent reigns of their more nomadic overlords, such as the Goths, the Huns, the Slavs, the Pechenegs, the Gepids, the Avars, and the Bulgars, just to name a few. But that these overlords largely did not bother the native population, who were, and remained, Roman. The other theory is known as the Immigration Theory. This one states that the Romanians are descended from a Romanized people who were settled to the south of the Danube originally. When the Eastern Roman Empire's borders completely collapsed in the 7th century, the Roman population of this area fled the invading Slavs. Some of the refugees moved south and admixed with Albanians, or Greeks, while others migrated north across the Danube, assuming a pastoral lifestyle deep in the Carpathian Mountains. This theory would explain why we see the distribution of Romanian speakers as it exists in the modern day. That is to say, that Romania is not the only place that one might find Romanian speakers. The language is spoken by a minority group known as the Vlachs in places like Albania and northern Greece to this day. These dialects of Romanian are known as Aromanian and Istro-Romanian. Neither theory is particularly conclusive. Archaeology and genetic analysis have been brought to bear on this question without much success. The main problem with the archaeology is that archaeologists cannot necessarily distinguish between a Slavic artifact influenced by contact with the Romans from a Romanian artifact. Similarly speaking, the genetic data remains puzzling. This is because there is no detailed analysis of the genetics of the Roman people. The Roman Empire was long a culturally and ethnically diverse place. Perhaps the original soldiers sent to conquer Dacia would have all come from a particular corner of the Roman Empire, not necessarily from Italy. This makes it very difficult to understand whether or not modern Romanian people have been there the whole time, or whether they migrated in the medieval period. At this point, I should say a few words about the term Vlach. Vlach, also known as Wallach, or Wallachian, is a historical term from the medieval period, and it referred to Latin-speaking people who lived north and south of the Danube. The term was also applied by Czech, Polish, and Hungarian people to Italians. 
probably because of the similarity of the language. The term first appears in Byzantine literature, or Eastern Roman Empire literature, of the 11th century. Eventually, the term would take on other connotations. At one point, it meant stranger or foreigner, before eventually coming to mean shepherd or nomad. In fact, the lifestyle of the Vlachs, as they practiced it in some of the wilder parts of northern and western Greece, is very similar to the Sarakatsani, a group of Greek nomads indigenous to the area. You could tell the two apart by their distinct forms of dress, and also by what language they spoke. Despite their differences, outsiders would frequently confuse the two groups. In fact, the Sarkatsani have a saying, if you hear a shepherd use the word lapte, the vlak and Romanian word for milk, then hit him over the head. Like most things, the more I've learned about this subject, the less I seem to understand it. As a result of making this episode, I found myself shifting wildly from the continuation camp into the immigration camp, and then back somewhere into the middle. Is it possible that the defenders in the forts on the Limes that survived the fall of the Western Roman Empire continued living, speaking Latin, and defending their river border deep into the 6th and 7th centuries before realizing that the military situation was hopeless and then decided to throw down their arms and armor and take to the hills in imitation of the pastoral people around them. This lifestyle of driving livestock from one place to another is certainly a more difficult way to spend one's time, but also safer. By retreating into the hills, you gain the advantage of anonymity. A group of people could virtually disappear and therefore never be conquered or assimilated. Perhaps this is how Romanian survived for all the years that it did. Spoken by transhumanist shepherds, who shrugged off the bonds of city living and thereby preserved a unique form of vulgar Latin that became today's Romanian. I'm sure that's about as clear as mud. Anyway, you've been listening to the Panorama Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm still Matt Lupu. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.